Hey, Kelly Allen is our guest. He's the ex- executive director of the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy. She joins us via telephone. Kelly, good morning to you. Good morning, Rob. Hi, everybody. Great to have you with us. Uh, what's, uh, what's that Seth guy doing today? Did you take the day off? We've got him on something else. I, I was getting a little jealous. I never get any uh, any radio time out your way. So. That's that's fair. Well, I can deal with that. Uh, Kelly, you've got some concerns about the Hope Scholarship. Could you tell me what those concerns are? Yeah, so after just about a year of the Hope Scholarship in effect, one full school year, um, there was very little that we knew about it. Um, the state treasurer's office, you know, announced how many kids were approved the first year and how many kids were approved again this year. Uh, but we wanted to dive a little bit more into the numbers. So we made a public re- uh, records re- request, uh, and we found that over $10 million in the first year was, you know, diverted from our public schools to private schools uh, and service providers. And in some cases, these are unaccredited private schools. Uh, unaccountable, really, with no public reporting required around the Hope Scholarship. And we know this year, the 23-24 uh, school year, it's doubled to more than $20 million already. So out of that $10 million, uh, we know already that over 300000 went out of state, uh, lots into Maryland and our other neighboring states. And that's really just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, it only accounts for p- payments to private schools. Uh, about $4 million went to school providers. So these aren't schools, but they're organizations or companies that provide things like tutoring and test prep and dance and martial arts lessons. And they're all approved Hope Scholarship vendors, too. Uh, we don't have the data breakdowns for where those dollars went yet. We're waiting on them. Uh, but we know that 57% of those approved Hope Scholarship service providers are not in West Virginia. So that $300,000 that went out of state is probably only the tip of the iceberg. Now, we knew from the legislation that they had approved money going to out-of-state schools, and when we interviewed delegates and senators about that, they mentioned border counties and how there might not be a good option uh, close by in West Virginia, but uh, right across the border there might be, and they didn't want to prevent people from doing that. So does that number come as a surprise or shock to you that it is that high, or were you prepared for something like that when you began this research? actually was pretty surprised about the figure, and I've, you know, heard from some lawmakers and other members that we've talked to um, since we've gotten this data that were pretty surprised at, you know, hearing hundreds of thousands of dollars are going out of state. Uh, We also found that almost $2 million went to unaccredited private schools uh, out of that $6 million, so about a third of the dollars. Uh, And according to the West Virginia Department of Education, these are schools that aren't required for teachers or personnel to have any certification. Uh, And they have very minimal standards regarding, you know, what they have to provide as far as curriculum or graduation readiness. Um, So I think this data, both the out-of-state expenditures and the expenditures to unaccredited schools, really shows the desperate need for more transparency and accountability. Um, There is currently no public reporting required regarding the expenditures or fraud. Um, the only reason we have this data is because we put in a FOIA request for it. Um, so, so we really think this should give the Treasurer's Office and the legislature a pause to really put some guardrails around the program uh, if this isn't what they intended it for, for it to be, uh, and really put in some standards for what schools and providers are eligible to receive these, which are taxpayer public education funds. Is there anything in the legislation that prevents money specifically from going to unaccredited schools? No, not at all. And I think um, in the legislature, you know, I read the state code again in preparation for for this work, and it says, you know, an eligible school for the purposes of the HOPE Scholarship is a school uh, that signs up to become a HOPE Scholarship vendor. Uh, It's very, (laughs) there's very broad uh, rules around it right now. Um, And as the cost of this program balloon, um, it doubled from last year to this year. Um, There's a trigger in the legislation that could make it universal, uh, which initial estimates were that could put it up over 140 or so million dollars a year. Um, There really need to be some guardrails and some parameters on, on where these public funds can go. And in your opening statement, you mentioned something about some of these funds going to martial arts lessons and some other type of extracurricular thing. Is that correct? Well, there's two categories um, of approved HOPE scholarship providers. So you can be a school, um, a private school, or um, a non-public school, or you can also be a service provider. Uh, And like I said, we don't have the data on the service provider expenditures, and presumably these are mostly expenditures to folks that have chosen homeschooling. Um, or perhaps they're in private school and they need some extra resources. But we do have a publicly available list of who those approved uh, HOPE scholarship public service providers are. And, yeah, there are things like tutoring, 
uh, things like test prep, but there are, you know, dance lessons and martial arts lessons and uh, many, many, many of those are located um, outside of West Virginia and far outside of West Virginia. We're talking about Arizona, California, Florida. Are you saying that in theory money could be used at those places or are you saying that money has actually been used at those places? Well, we're waiting to find that out. So they are approved vendors for the purposes of the HOPE Scholarship, meaning they would be eligible to receive money. Uh, but uh, we actually put in an, adi- an additional uh, public re- records request last week to just find out what the actual expenditures to those providers have been. Okay, so I want to I be clear. At this time, there's no evidence that money has been spent on or distributed to people who are using those services. What we do know is that um, the HOPE Scholarship Board has approved those services as eligible HOPE Scholarship services. Okay, Matt Harvey. Good Good morning, Miss Allen. Uh, <laughs> When you keep talk, you keep mentioning um, un- unapproved schools, unaccredited, unaccredited schools. I, I, I'm trying to understand what that is. I, I don't know if I know of any examples. Um, are you familiar with anything maybe over here in the Eastern Panhandle that's an unaccredited school? Sure, I can try to pull that up. So or, we um, or is that like these home these these? It's not it's not just homeschoolers. No, these this doesn't include micro schools or. Uh, homeschoolers. These are okay. private schools. Um, oh, they're private. And the West Virginia Department of Education keeps a list. Um, they have private schools which are accredited, and those school accreditation isn't done through the Department of Education. They acknowledge Christian accrediting bodies and other accrediting bodies. Um, and there are, you know, about 1.7 million dollars uh, out of that six million that went to private schools that went to non-accredited schools. Um, so a few examples are, I'm trying to look in your part of the state. There's one in Mercer County that got about $150,000 in the first year. Uh, one in Cabell, 150000 Mon County. I'm not. Yeah. No. What's the one in Mercer? Mercer Christian Academy. Okay. Are you familiar with those? I am. Folks might. Yeah, yeah. Well, but but none of, none of those are near the eastern panhandle. No. I, and, and I can tell you, I, I'm pretty sure that the spirit – Aver, uh, runs advertisements from Goretti in Hagerstown uh, saying we, we accept the HOPE scholarship. Um, is, is, there, is, is, is there an issue with that it's going out of state or it's, it, is the issue that it's, it's hard to track? For us, the issue is really about public accountability. I mean, what we're essentially doing is taking public education dollars that have been in our public school system uh, which are, you know, very accountable through public reporting uh, according for budgets and, and learning goals and testing and all of those sorts of things. Uh, and now what we're doing through this privatization is, um, you know, sending taxpayer dollars to schools that are essentially unaccountable. You know, it's in the public's interest. It's in our economic interest. It's in our family's interest to ensure that schools are of quality, are being run in a way that benefits all of us. Uh, but right now, we don't have any accountability about the expenditures, uh, and there's no, uh, there are no guardrails or public uh, reporting required around this program. John Gilstrap. The, the number you mentioned of, of $10 million, that's what was spent in the HOPE Scholarship last year, is that right? That's right. And how many students were involved in that, that $10 million? 2,333, I believe, is the exact number. All right. And if if we had 23, let's call it 2,400. If we had 2,400 students doing the same work within the county and and how, how much do we spend per capita per student? I mean, how much is is this a disproportionately large number or is it kind of track? I can't do that math. <laughs> well, what happens with this HOPE scholarship is that students uh, who are approved are able to take their state share of the school aid formula, which is about $4,400, uh, and spend that elsewhere outside of the school. Um, so it's a wash. The fact that they're not in the state or they're not in the public school system, but in a different school system, it's kind of a wash to the taxpayer. Well, it's not a wash to our public schools, which continue to educate the vast majority of our public students. You know, I've been talking to a lot of local school officials trying to get really a sense of what's the impact on the ground in our public schools. And in some ways, the impact is delayed a little bit because Um, There's a delay in when the uh, attendance counts are taken and then when that actually hits the budget. 
Uh, but um, talking to folks, you know, I talked to one county official and who didn't give me permission, so I won't name him or say the county, but, you know, for every 100 Hope Scholarship students they lose from the public schools, that's about 12 positions that they'll lose. That's a mix of teachers and school service personnel. And if you think about a county that has, you know, five or six schools, 13 grade levels, that's not enough to, you know, you're not going to lose 25 first graders or 25 seventh graders and just say, okay, we'll get rid of a classroom. But you're losing funding for 12 personnel. So that's, you know, maybe less classroom aids, maybe less classes that can be offered, maybe larger classroom sizes. So we're, you know, leaving behind serious effects in our public schools, which will continue to educate the vast majority of kids, regardless of expansions of the Hope Scholarship. But but given that it, it, at the personal level, the schooling experience is about the individual child. And if the individual child is getting better, um, more more appropriate education, I won't say better education, but obviously there's a reason why people pursue the Hope Scholarship instead of staying within the public schools. If this is better for the, for the individual child, isn't that then better for all of us? Well, I think that, I mean, that's, a, that's an open question. I mean, I think there are real questions about you know, need for resources for our public schools. I think, you know, in the eastern panhandle where you are, that's particularly acute where, you know, teacher, you know, teacher pay isn't competitive with neighboring states. Um, I think, you know, most of us agree that our public schools need more resources, not fewer, but every HOPE scholarship is, you know, lost resources for our public schools. And then I think there's, you know, a question about who, choice for who. Um, you know, this program is really young in West Virginia, but in states like Arizona and Wisconsin and Missouri, where we've seen, you know, expansion of programs like these, like voucher programs, uh, research shows that, you know, 70 to 80 percent of kids who are taking advantage of these programs were already in private school to begin with. So in a lot of ways, in other states, we've seen these programs subsidize wealthy families who were either already in private school or could already afford it already. Um, and this isn't really extending choice to, you know, kids in rural schools or lower income schools, uh, because the Hope Scholarship is about $1,800 a year less than the average private school tuition. And that's before we even talk about, you know, private schools don't have to provide transportation, lunch, books, uh, all these additional costs that pile up on top of the, the tuition costs. So, you know, I'm not sure it remains to be seen. And some of this is, you know, calling for more public reporting and more accountability. But, um, you know, choice for who is a real question that we should be asking. Well, I, well choice for the, the student and for the families. I mean, if, if we look at I'm going to get the specific numbers wrong here, but I think it would be close. Um, we had a guest on the show last week that was talking about uh, we are 26th in the nation on per capita spending in public schools. And we're right at what, 48th, 49th, depending on where Mississippi is at any given time in terms of performance in the public schools. So there's something in this process that is broken. And it, it seems to me that if, in fact, we're going to spend X amount of money on on Johnny Jones, whether he's in the public school or he's going to be part of the Hope Scholarship, if Johnny Jones gets a, a more appropriate education and will achieve more, then that's that's kind of worth it. And the antidote to all of that is to fix the system so that they don't feel compelled to go elsewhere. Well, I think it will be hard to fix the system with fewer resources. I don't think any, you know, issues that we are experiencing in our public schools will be better served by less resources. And, you know, these, this HOPE scholarship growth and potential expansion is coming on top of big sweeping income tax cuts passed this year. So we're making the pie, the budget pie, smaller to start. Uh, and then we're saying that, you know, the HOPE scholarship is going to take a bigger and bigger and bigger piece of that pie. And, you know, by nature, that's going to leave potentially fewer resources for our public schools. And then I do want to go back to that point about better options. I mean, I think it remains to be seen. You know, if we're talking about parents who've always had the safety net of knowing, you know, our public schools are, you know, teachers meet certain certifications, uh, certain benchmarks had to be met. And now we have, you know, potentially they're putting their kids in unaccredited schools. I'm not sure if parents know in every case that their kids are in unaccredited schools. I mean, we really need to know uh, if achievement benchmarks are being met. And frankly, in other schools and states with broad school voucher program, I mean, the achievement metrics are, are really not there. What is the difference between an accredited school and an unaccredited? What, what are the metrics that make one make a school unaccredited? What don't they have? 
accredited, uh, the West Virginia Department of Education recognizes uh, accreditation from private entities like Christian school accreditation uh, bodies and others. Um, and according to the Department of Education, not accredited schools are not required for their personnel to have any certifications. Uh, and they're not allowed to, required to have any uh, requirements for graduation beyond um, literate, like a definition around literacy and like a very low um, percentile testing. But there just aren't the same guardrails and requirements around curriculum, around benchmarks for graduation, and around personnel and teacher certification. Well, how important a factor can that be if, in fact, we are 26th, give or take, in per capita spending and down at the bottom in terms of performance? And if the people who, if, if, if the performance reflects all accredited uh, instruction, one, one could argue that it's, that accreditation is perhaps not, a, not all that important or successful. Oh, well, I mean, I would, I would certainly disagree. I mean, I think, again, I just keep going back to um, the needs in our public schools will not be improved with fewer resources. Uh, and, it, you know, if, if private schools and, and other Hope Scholarship vendors are, you know, um, are accepting public taxpayer dollars, what these dollars are, I think, you know, it's important that they be subject to the same rigorous public accountability that our schools are, which allows us to do those sorts of rankings. Kelly Allen has been our guest here on the program, Executive Director of the West Virginia Center for Budget and Policy. Matt, did you have a final question? I, I was just going to ask if we had any, and I know there are, there's some legislatures that, that listen to this show regularly, what suggestions would you have for them to, to fix this? Well, I mean, I think first and foremost, I've said it several times, I mean, accountability and transparency. Uh, Arizona, you know, should be a cautionary tale for us in a lot of ways because their universal vouchers program is costing hundreds of millions of dollars more a year uh, than expected to the point that their governor is warning they might have a general revenue budget shortfall this year. Uh, but they do have quarterly reporting where they say, you know, any accusations of fraud, they say every, like, you know, what school district students are coming from, where the money is going, uh, every quarter that is publicly reported. Um, we've also heard Riley Moore talk about potentially expanding the program to have year-round open enrollment, where right now it's between March and May. Uh, and then, as we discussed briefly, there's also a trigger that would expand this program to make it universal. I would very, very, very strongly suggest before any expansions of the program, we get our arms around um, what's happening right now through some more transparency uh, and some public reporting requirements for where the funds are going. Would a possible solution be that these the, the receiving entities of these funds be required to use the auditor's uh, West Virginia checkbook program? Just at least then they'll have more eyes on it, and, and that's an easy first step? I mean, perhaps, but I think really, you know, more rigorous accountability around, you know, the education, the, students, the qualifications of their staff, those sorts of things is really important, too. Kelly, did you have to FOIA this information, or was it readily available? We had to FOIA it. Is the information otherwise not readily available? That's right. That's right. Uh, in the code, the only thing that has to be reported publicly is the list of uh, vendors. Uh, and schools for parents who are considering the HOPE scholarship, but that's the only thing in code that has to be publicly uh, publicly available. So at the moment, there's nothing that the average taxpayer could do to look into these numbers other than file a FOIA? That's my understanding. Can they view the information that you folks have uh, received on your website? We put out um, uh, some information on the the funding going out of state and the funding going to unaccredited schools, yeah, on our website at wvpolicy.org, uh, and we're going to be publishing a broader report uh, probably in a month or so that really dives a little bit more into what the impact is going to be on our public schools, uh, who will continue to educate the vast majority of our students. Kelly, thank you so much for your time today. We very much appreciate it. Say hello to Seth for me. Will do. Thank you. You're quite welcome. At 9.30, that's uh, Kelly Allen, Executive Director for the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy. That is a private entity, by the way, not affiliated with the state of West Virginia government. 